Welcome to Lecture 4 of Advanced Microeconomics with me, Dr. Craig Webb. In today's lecture, we're going to continue our study of asymmetric information. In this lecture, we're going to be looking at a competitive market for insurance. And when we introduce the ideas of asymmetric information, we'll be looking at something called screening or incentive compatibility one of the most important ideas in modern microeconomics. The model we will cover today is due to economists, economists uh, Rothschild and Stiglitz. Joseph Stiglitz uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize for his contributions to the economics of information. Now a professor at Columbia in New York, uh, Joseph Stiglitz uh, was at Manchester uh, running the Brooks World Poverty Institute a few years ago and is one of the all-time great minds to have ever considered economic problems. So lots to do today. Let's get started. So let's begin our lecture today with a quote from Rothschild and Stiglitz, 1977. An absolutely brilliant quote. If you ever write a research paper in economics, which I hope you do, uh, writing, beginning your paper with something that says everybody thinks one thing and they are wrong is just about the best way you can start a paper. So here is the quote. Economic theorists traditionally banish discussions of information to footnotes. Serious consideration of costs of communication, imperfect knowledge and the like would, it is believed, complicate without informing. This comforting myth is false. So let's just take a moment to think about the um, the, the world of economics before information was taken seriously. Now, you all already have studied uh, general equilibrium theory, and you know some, some very well-known results like the first welfare theorem. You know, e equilibrium exists, and equi competitive equilibrium is Pareto efficient, and any efficient uh, allocation can be supported by a set of equilibrium prices. These are kind of the uh, the foundational results of neoclassical microeconomics. When we studied those models, of course, we made many simplifying assumptions. And of many of them, uh, of course, if you made the model more complicated, of course would change the results, but not in a serious way. They wouldn't completely transform what we know about economics. They would just complicate the model somewhat. Information is different. If we, if we study asymmetric information and include it in our models, not only will the model become more complicated and realistic, but the results in a qualitative sense will drastically change. We will see equilibrium uh, necessarily being inefficient. So it will involve, there will be large costs due to this asymmetric information. And also, as we'll see later, equilibrium may even fail to exist, making it very difficult to predict what's going to happen and perhaps making uh, giving you the idea the market may be very volatile and even possibly to the brink of collapse. So this changes everything we know about economics. Let's introduce the model that we're going to be working with today. It's a very simple model of an insurance market, the Stiglitz-Rothschild model. Now, don't be um, put off by the fact that this is a very simple model. Indeed, it's not supposed to be entirely realistic and capture everything uh, that is relevant in insurance markets. Rather, we're setting up a very simple model that will work perfectly when we have perfect information. We'll be able to very quickly get all of the kinds of results, very nice results, that we expect in perfectly competitive markets with perfect information. So equilibrium will exist, it will be easy to describe, it will be Pareto efficient, and so on. Then, as we introduce asymmetric information, we're going to see a drastic change in the results that we get in this model. So by keeping the model simple and then introducing asymmetric information, we see how 
um, important the idea of taking information seriously really is. So let's describe the formal details of this model. We will assume that there are two states of the world, and we will call these the good state, capital G, and the bad state, capital B. We'll note why we call them the good and bad states in a moment. The objects of choice in this model, the things that the consumer will have preferences for, the things that the insurance firms will be selling, are called contracts. And these are two-dimensional objects, so we'll denote a typical contract as C, lowercase c, and this has two dimensions, C, G, which denotes consumption in the good state, and CB, which denotes consumption in the bad state. So contracts are state-dependent consumptions, sometimes called random consumptions or consumption with uncertainty. When one owns a contract, one is not sure precisely um, the level of consumption you will end up with. However, you are able to describe the level of consumption once you know the state of the world. We will assume that consumers have an endowment, which is essentially a contract, a state-dependent consumption, a random consumption. But an endowment is something that the consumer owns. So you can think of it as their initial position, the thing which they will only trade if they want to. So we'll denote an endowment as lowercase e, which of course has two uh, dimensions, e-g, the endowment level of consumption should the good state occur, and e-b is the endowment level of consumption should the consumer find themselves in the bad state. We're going to assume that e-g is strictly greater than e-b. So this is why we call state B the bad state. The consumer's initial position is that their level of consumption is uncertain and in the, if the bad state occurs, then this consumer will have lower consumption than if the good state had occurred. You could think of the good state or bad state in various ways. So it could represent perhaps an accident that occurs or it could represent a change in the consumer's health. And if this happens, then they end up with a lower level of consumption. So their initial position is one of uncertainty. And of course, the desire to remove that uncertainty is what is the function of an insurance market. The next key feature of this model is that we're going to assume there are two types of consumers. We'll denote these capital H for a high risk type of consumer and capital L for a low risk type of consumer. Now, how do we interpret this? In this model, every consumer faces the possibility that the bad state might happen. However, if a consumer is high risk, this simply means that there is a greater chance that that type of consumer will find themselves in state B. So the bad state is more likely for high risk consumers than for low risk consumers, although perfectly possible for both types of consumers. To quantify this, we'll denote by PH and PL the probabilities that high and low risk types respectively end up in the bad state. So we're going to assume that PL and PH are both between 0 and 1. So the bad state and the good state are both possible. However, we're going to assume that PH is strictly greater than PL to quantify the idea that high risk types are more likely to end up in the bad state than low risk types. Now that we have assumed there are two types of consumers, high risk types and low risk types, we're going to study various informational assumptions regarding these types. For example, 
perfect information in our case will be that um, consumers know what type of consumer they are and firms are also able to identify the different types of consumers. When we study void information, okay, so nobody knows anything about anything, this will mean that firms cannot distinguish between different types of consumers and consumers also do not know their type. The most interesting case for us will be the case of asymmetric information. And we will study this just in one direction, the direction where a consumer knows his own type, but firms are not able to distinguish between different types of consumers. So let's suppose that we pick a consumer from the market at random. Well, we're going to assume that there is a probability beta, which is between zero and one, that that consumer picked at random is a low risk type. This is a parameter we will assume that we know. You can think of beta as the proportion or the fraction of low risk types in the population. So if beta was equal to one, then there are only low risk types in the population. If beta were equal to zero, there would be only high risk types in the population. And if beta is between zero and one, then there will be some fraction beta of low risk types and some fraction one minus beta of high risk types in the population. It's convenient also to work with an additional type of consumer, um, which is essentially the type of consumer who does not know their own type. So we will denote this as type capital X or the unknown type. What can we say about an unknown type's probability of ending up in the bad state? Well, there is a beta probability that they are low risk and then the probability that they end up in the bad state is PL. Or there is with one minus beta probability a chance that they are high risk, in which case the probability of ending up in the bad state is pH. So we will denote by P subscript capital X the probability that an unknown type or a type chosen at random has the probability of being in the bad state PX is equal to beta times PL plus one minus beta times by pH. Of course, PX lies between pH and PL because beta is between 0 and 1. Now that we've introduced the basic ingredients of the model, in the next video we will study the behaviour of firms and consumers uh, and develop graphical tools, ISO costs and indifference curves to analyse this model before we develop the idea of a competitive equilibrium which we will analyse under various informational assumptions.